Uh, We're recording now, Andy. Okay, so I'm calling the Finance Committee meeting of March 28, 2023 to order at 3 p.m. Thank everybody for being here. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this extent of this meeting is being conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. Uh, no in-person attendance of members of the public is being permitted, but every effort is being made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. And I'm going to start by going through the committee and um, make sure that everybody on the committee can hear and we can hear them. So, Anna. Hi, everybody. Lynn. Present. Bob. I'm here. Matt. Present. Bernie. I'm here. Kathy. Here. And uh, uh, so um, all members of the committee are accounted for because Alicia had informed us at last night's council meeting that she would not be able to attend uh, the meeting today, and uh, which uh, I will treat um, as a follow up as an um, additional item not anticipated 48 hours in advance because I didn't know it until last night. So it is legitimately within 48 hours. And that is that we need to set up a process to try and um, find out how we can find, get a meeting time that all members of the committee can be present. But um, in any event, we will um, proceed with today's meeting. Um, before going to um, the business of the meeting, and um, I need to at least um, let you know that uh, we're in a little bit of a period of um, uncertainty as to how we're going to proceed procedurally, but we do think we have a plan. And uh, Lynn might explain some of this too. But uh, those, uh, we uh, reached a realization that uh, the order was presented by the town manager. And if the town manager's presentation of an order is consistent with the procedures set forth in MGL chapter 44, section 32, then uh, there's a um, problem with what Alicia and some of them and a lot of members of the council want, which is uh, order, uh, orders can not be increased, they can only be agreed to or reduced. And uh, in order to, uh, we're trying to get that confirmed with uh, town attorney. And uh, then also what we're looking for, maybe looking for today, and I think we are gonna be looking for today, is um, to turn the question into whether the committee wants to make a request to the town manager to change the order. And then there's some procedural pieces that may fall into play that would cause us to delay the vote. But uh, if uh, we ask the town manager to do that and he does, then we're back within the scope where um, the council will have the ability to make uh, a decision as uh, we had been anticipated. So um, I'm going to call on Lynn before I get to Kathy. And Lynn, do you have anything to add to what I just said? Um, no, but I have um, a question uh, of Sean Mangano. Go ahead, because we're trying to, at this point, I'm trying just to make sure that we all understand the process, because then I think that if we get to the point where we agree that 
um, the appropriate thing to do is to whether or not to make that request to the town manager that um, we need to proceed with the discussion that we intended to have just with a little bit of different process that flows from it but gets us back to where we want to be. So go ahead and ask your question. Sean, what is the amount that is presently in the capital reserve, a capital stabilization fund? Yeah, so the capital stabilization fund, the um, the transfers that went into it were um, from free cash and from the general stabilization fund were nine million two hundred eighty-seven thousand four sixty-five um, was the initial balance to start the year. And that's that would be there for what's in it now. Yeah, so the, the way our reserves work, especially our long-term reserves, is that, that we work with a financial advisor to invest them um, uh, and when we follow our investment policy. So there is a portion of our long-term investments that are invested in um, the state-approved list of publicly traded companies. Um, there's 20 or so companies, and so there's a uh, somewhere it fluctuates based on economic uh, conditions, but somewhere between 10 and 20% of our long-term investments get put into those types of investments. Um, and it served us very well. It's one of the reasons why our reserves have grown. Um, it's helped grow our reserves over the last several years. Um, so the balance with the way that works is we get a quarterly update as to the market value of that portion of our investments. And then we update our, our um, our different long-term stabilization funds, our general stabilization fund and our capital stabilization fund. So the number um, went up for December, um, but I haven't received the March. Uh, the March quarter isn't complete yet. Um, so I think the safe thing to do would be to go with the initial balance that was in that fund to begin the year, uh, which is the 9,287,465 um, and, and go with that figure. Okay. And um, the reason I asked that question is because if there's going to be a motion to increase, to request that the town manager increase the financial order, I strongly urge that it not be for any more than what is presently in the stabilization fund, the in the capital stabilization fund. Okay, thank you. Kathy, you had your hand up. I, I do, because I I have a basic question on this. Um, on are we making it? I know you're talking about procedure. My memory of the Jones Library when we voted on it, um, we voted on there was a total amount of money. There was amount coming from a grant from the library. There was amount coming from CPA. There was a mount coming from the town, and then there was the wish, uh, the pledge from the library. So it had all these pieces that added up. So we're never going to have a financial order that would be more than ninety-eight, correct, Sean? I'm right. So, so that's that's the point. I think that's important, is and one of the reasons why we're going to check with the uh, council to get it straight is that the um, what's being considered right now, whether to use five million or the nine point three million of capital stabilization. Um, none of that increases the appropriation. It changes the makeup of the comp of the appropriation, changes the funding sources. Um, and so we need to get a little clarity from our council whether that triggers, um, you know, whether that triggers additional steps or whether that can just be an amendment um, that the town manager would accept and, and we can okay. still follow the timeline that we have. That that was my question because Andy, you said increase. It doesn't increase. It it changes the components. Is the the point I was making the components, and right now, to the extent there's a draft, since I haven't seen a draft, I've just seen the table. Does, does the draft have the five in it? Um, would it be helpful if I share the the full yes. order? Um, so I'm just saying. Yeah, the right I was going to offer to do that too. So, but why don't you go ahead? But. To answer the question, I use the term increase in reference to increasing the amount that we would take from the stabilization fund, not increasing the bottom line. Of so I, I understand that. I just wanted to say that the, to me, I'm, I'm pretty simple minded. There's a top line that says 98. And then there's something underneath it that says, where's that money coming from? Mm -hmm. And Correct. so we're talking about how much is coming from the debt exclusion. 
and adding it all up has to add to 98. So I just wanted to be really clear that it's not in or whatever, the 97 point. Right. Okay. So that was my mm -hmm. point. So okay, the, yeah, good. this number has not changed the total appropriation. Okay. Um, the pieces that have changed, um, and actually it hasn't, I, I spoke to the MSBA grant um, changing, that was already updated in the original order. So the 67, uh, 0.66%, that's the correct percentage. Um, the, if the count, uh, finance committee and the council wanted to do a different number from capital stabilization, the areas that would change would be this 5 million um, would change. And this amount up here, the 92, 492, this is the borrowing authorization. So those are the two uh, figures that balance each other out to get to the 97 total appropriation. So if one goes up, the other one goes down. Um, and then you can see that in the table here. Um, these two at the top of the table are what comprise the appropriation um, to get to the total of the 97 million. Again, this table shows the total project cost because uh, we were asked to do that from the MSBA, but the appropriation is for 97, 492, 297. And then where do you show the MSBA piece? You don't have to show it here. So it's clearly- The only place you show it is the in terms of the percentage. So where that shows up is provided how further that the grant, um, the time we received from the MSBA for the project shall not exceed the lesser of um, the percentage of eligible costs. So you don't put a, uh, we don't have to put the specific dollar amount um, here or they ask for the percentage. Okay. But our understanding, because if anyone looked at that table, it doesn't add up to the total. So we're saying. No. Well, because as you know, we, like like with other projects, we have to authorize the full amount um, yep. of yep. the project in order to proceed. Yeah. So I'm, I'm mainly, we did this once with Jones is the only way I remember it. So I know Anna, Anna was not there for that. So it's the, it's kind of complicated. Just you see this number and it doesn't even add up to the total. So my point was, we're talking about what's on line two. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. the the FY whatever is it a five or is it something bigger right exactly yep and the whole council you know when we when, again I'm I'm just doing the one time I've been through this um the whole council I raised the question whether the CPA money for Jones was seen as a gift or was it do we need to vote on it separately? And we voted as a package because we hadn't voted that yet, you know, on how we were going to treat it. So we haven't yet voted on the five as a council, but the way you're doing this, if we take your package, it has the five in it, correct? Right. And, and you may remember the finance committee voted right. sort of an informal recommendation of five, which is- Okay. Uh, no, so that's, um, I just, yeah. so my, you've, You've answered my question that the five is currently in this, and what we're talking about is they're a different number. Right. Um, and and this is the order that's been posted for the uh, for the forum as well. Um, okay. so, so this is the any changes would be to this. Okay, thank you. So um, the council last night voted to request that the finance committee consider increasing the 5 million to 10 million with um, so that um, that re that request is was submitted to the committee and what we're trying to do is bring us back to um, a discussion on that topic and the outcome of what we do with it, will change a little bit because of what was just explained about the process, but um, we still want to um, want to get back to what the council asked us to talk about in its final vote last night. And, um, and uh, I know that the resident members may not, Bernie wasn't there, and I don't know if Bob and Matt stayed up until the bloody end or, uh, Andy, excuse me, uh, I, I wanted to ask one clarifying question of Sean. Go ahead. Um, the MSBA is going to determine what is the eligible portion that they're going to reimburse against. So as we're looking at the $99 million figure, we can't expect that the MSBA is going to start with that number. Is that correct? 
Correct. We have the number and it was part of the presentation last night. So um, we had a meeting with the MSBA on Monday, last Monday, um, a project scope and budget meeting where they went through all of the different categories of costs. Um, they did not make many changes to it other than, as I, you may not have heard this, Bernie, I mentioned last night that they updated our reimbursement rate for 2023 and it did not move in a, in a positive direction and moved in a negative direction. Um, but it is that the, our maximum rate is that 67.66%, which is our base rate plus incentives for um, building a net zero school and for uh, our maintenance policies and procedures. Um, but th we do have a number from that, that meeting that of uh, sort of the maximum MSBA facility grant. So if our budget proceeds exactly as it um, exists on paper and we expend everything exactly as it exists on paper, we have the maximum grant number uh, that we would receive. And it was about $40 million. Okay. Just, Thank you. And it's and and the what they said, you know, since the official is not for a few weeks, Bernie, they said this is what the staff is recommending to the board. You know, this is the the table we're seeing is 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 on its way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There always is the caution, and I'll just do it again. There's always a caution that we have chosen to vote this before the MSBA board meeting. Um which in an ideal world we might not do, but because we wanted to have this vote before the um, the town-wide vote, because we wanted it to be clear how the, the council felt about this. Um, there's always the chance some, you know, the MSBA could find a mistake or they could do something that we might have to revisit this after the town-wide vote in May. Um, so that's just a caution. We don't anticipate that's the case. We've looked at the numbers with OPM or the MSBA, they've blessed, they've looked at all the wording, um, but there is always that caution that if something, you know, something at the board meeting or if they find something along the way that was just a mistake um, and, and maybe even a positive, you know, some things we're hoping might move in a positive direction um, that we might have to revisit it after the town-wide vote again. In the number that was in the order that was in the packet last week that you just put on the screen, is the number from that most recent meeting with them? Yeah, the, the 67.66% is the the number. Okay. Does that answer all your questions, Bernie? For you? So um, I think that what we need to um, do is, yeah, uh, Lynn, you have your hand up. I'm, I was going to make a motion. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, do you think we want to do public comment first and before you make the motion, or do you want to make the motion? You're the chair. Um, I just as soon make the motion and get a second and then move into the discussion and have public comment. Okay. Um, you're, you're chairing this is when Andy. Okay, I, I, so why don't we do this? Let's get the order, get the motion. Because I think I, I have a sense, but don't know until you make it. But go ahead and make the motion. If we get a second, then it frames the discussion. We will um, allow some discussion within the committee for a little bit of time. Um, I know that Matt has to leave briefly at 3.30, I believe, and, but is going to be back. Um, and uh, we will try and do public comment with uh, fairly soon after a little bit of discussion, which may help frame the public comment, but I do want to get allow that to take place. And the other thing is, uh, I know that they just uh, is here, but has uh, gone off screen because we're not getting this, but uh, there was a request that um, we develop information regarding the, uh, how, how the subsidized and reduced um, housing works. And uh, he was uh, obviously not available last night, but he is attending the meeting for that purpose. I know there's several counselors in the audience, so I don't want to delay getting to Nate either. Um, so uh, why don't we try and uh, uh, move it along in an orderly fashion? Maybe I'll um, have Nate do his report just before public comment uh, if he's available. And I know that he's probably trying to get something else done at the same time. Lynn, I'm going to recognize you because you have a motion that you would like to put. 
for us. I'm going to make a motion. I'm going to hopefully have a second, and then I'd like to speak to the motion. My motion is to ask the town manager to issue a new financial order that includes taking from reserves from the capitalization stable, capital stabilization fund, the amount of $9,287,465. I is there a second to the motion? Shane seconds. Okay, so we have a motion that has been made by Lynn, seconded by Kathy, and uh, I think that explains itself. Uh, Sean. Um, so the one clarification I would pose is, Lynn, do you want there to be a new order submitted by the town manager in that amount, or do you want to consider amending the existing order to that amount. Again, if, if we go the new order, it's pretty clear we would have to start the, we'd probably have to start the process off process over um, in terms of um, scheduling a hearing, posting on the bulletin, which is not, it's not, we have plenty of time in terms of um, going forward. So that that's an option. The other option, which we were hoping to get advice from legal counsels in the next day or so was, could the existing um, order be amended to just change the funding sources, um, but keep the over the same total overall appropriation? So my motion would be to either amend or if necessary, issue a new order. Okay. And Kathy agree as the seconder? Yeah, I'm, and because as I said, mentally, I just think it's changing that line. So whatever you've, wherever this goes, that's that's the change we'd be talking about. So whether it had that same number at the top or not. Okay, yeah, thanks. Because of, uh, all of this got discovered uh, within the past hours, uh, we are, in, uh, I should be careful. Some members of our staff are actively trying to uh, talk to our attorney um, to, make sure that we're properly advised on the process that we're using going forward. So with that, you want to speak to the motion? I do. This is a very painful motion. Um, it's a motion that I've thought long and hard about, and I'm going to continue to think about until we vote on it in council. We've built these reserves for many, many things. The school is high in my priority list. So I really want to say, here's my reason why. It's become clearer and clearer to me that we're spending our time and energy on the wrong discussion. Whether we divert this amount of money or 5 million or nothing to the school project from our capital stabilization. The most important decision is that we build this school. And if this is what it takes to get enough votes to build this school, then I just have to say, I pledge to do everything I can and will continue to do to bring in other reserves to build our other projects. I'm not walking away from them. I just feel we need to get on to the real issue and that is to pass this school vote. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Matt, I know you have to take off for a few minutes and come back. You want to please, uh, I'm recognizing you. Thank you. Have your hand up. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, and thank you, Lynn uh, and everybody. Um, so yeah, I, I just want to make a few comments about where we're at in this process um, before I share my thoughts about drawing from the reserves for the project. Um, first of all, most importantly, I really want to appreciate the amount of time and energy that Everybody has put into this particular question, um, counselors, voters, and especially town staff. Um, the staff uh, has been just incredibly responsive to every question and idea that's come out during this process. Um, in addition, I especially want to appreciate uh, Councillor Walker, who is raising very real concerns about the cost of housing in this area uh, and in town. Um, housing affordability is going to continue to be a challenge for us as a town for many years to come. And I suggest that if town council were to make a referral to the finance committee about housing affordability, this could be an issue that we could study. Um, it might also be the appropriate subject for, an own, for its own study committee. 
Um, however, I've heard many hours of discussion and presentation on the topic, and I do not feel the use of reserves on the school building project is the answer or even um, the beginning of an answer for how to address housing affordability in Amherst. Um, I'm happy to say that there seems to be a consensus among all of us uh, that the elementary school project is the right financial decision for the town. The overwhelming percentage of voters that I speak to feel the same way. Um, folks understand that the expense of repairing and maintaining our two aging school buildings is money poorly spent. They also understand that we would be on our own to pay for those repairs, as opposed to taking advantage of over 40 million in state funding if we build the new school. I do speak to the occasional voter who is not in support of the school building project, and it's usually because of the cost. I can say fairly confidently, these are folks who are unable to support an additional cost of about $450 a year in property tax. I, I do not believe they will change their vote from a no to a yes on May 2nd on the basis of a $45 savings or whatever the relevant savings is for them. And so um, we need a functional school building for the long-term benefit of the town. Schools bring new residents, improve property values, and energize the community. They are net economic assets in addition to becoming to being educational and climate assets, as our new school will be. Um, that being said, we need a functioning fire station. I do not believe that we have done an adequate job of communicating the plan for the Hickory Ridge site for the new fire station. Uh, this seems to have been a fairly recent development, and of course the plan is still being developed. Um, however, if Sean's projections are accurate, I don't believe we can afford to wait another 10 years to provide the men and women of our fire department with an adequate building site to work out of. Um, I strongly support the new elementary school building project, as everybody knows, I'm sure, uh, but I do not support the use of capital reserves to finance it. Good, thank you, Matt. Um, are there any other preliminary statements from members of the committee before we uh, do the two other things that I want to do next, which is in some order to public, in one or two orders to public comment and hear from Nate? Bob? Yeah, I, I, having sat through the, the council meeting last night, it's clear to me that um, the school is a lightning rod right now. Um, and we, the last time we saw something like this in town was the previous time when we tried to build a new elementary school. And we had some pretty bad uh, feelings generated on both sides, and it's kind of split the town in a way that I hadn't seen since I moved here in 2000. And I don't want to see us repeat that again. So I think that whatever the decision is reached by the council, I think we need to make it very clear that um, there's consensus, at least I believe there's consensus for a new school. And how we pay for it is, you know, part of the discussion, but we can't let that get in the way of building the new school. And we can't let it split the town the way that we had um, the split the last time, which was not healthy for the town. Thanks. Bernie. Thank you, Andy. Um... I know that Lynn has worked long and hard on the whole subject of getting a new fire station. So for her to make that motion, um, <clears throat> she she certainly didn't do it lightly and, and I'm sure she's gonna continue to think about the implications here. Um, I continue to be disappointed in the fact that we've had a, you know staff in this, this committee, it, previous iterations of this committee, work long and hard on trying to figure out how to fund the capital projects without <clears throat> an inordinate increase in the uh, in the tax rate. Uh, I understand we have a high tax rate. We also have one of the most expensive school systems in, in the state in terms of educating students. Uh, we're building a much more expensive building than we originally planned. Uh, and we're operating in an interest environment we we basically pit our, our our fiddling around with this basically let us um, pass by um, a historically low interest rate environment. So now we're facing more costs. Uh, I um, 
don't want to spend any more stabilization money on this project than the $5 million that the committee's proposed. I think that's sufficient. We have to look at the other capital needs we have. Those are gonna to have to be met. Those are gonna to have to be paid for. And I think we're caught up in some, we, we shouldn't get ourselves caught up in some short-term thinking that because we have uh, $9.3 million in capital stabilization, we can then spend it on this project. Uh, I think the point that, uh, that Matt made is very well taken. I think the points that Bob made are very well taken. Uh, in the long run, the school needs to be built. Otherwise, we'll make yet another stupid mistake. Um, the previous stupid mistake being what we didn't build in the first place. So um, I'm going to voice again that I don't want to spend the extra money on the school because we have other, other pressing projects that benefit every single person in this town. And um, we'll, we'll let it go at that. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um. I just want to echo what Bob said um, about dividing versus uniting. Um, the up until this discussion, and the five million seemed to be a uniter. Um, people liked the idea. Up until this discussion, the overwhelming response to the school, the design of it, the 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 potential of it, including the climate action. And I think of it as a really much better project, Bernie. I think we're investing in kids, climate and community in a way that's pretty unique. And it's also the timing for all the weirdness about timing. Suddenly Eversource wants to give, give us a chunk of money. The federal government wants it. You know, everyone is worried about the world we live in and the air we're breathing in. And so there's climate money on the table. And so we can't miss this moment. So I am doing everything I can to talk about the school and getting very positive responses. So I would, I'll do, I'll go anywhere others are willing to, to unite around this rather than divide. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, because of the high taxes in town, you know, something more than five, you know, whether it's one, two, three, or four, since we don't have 10, makes more of a difference for people with a very high property value than it does with the people with a very low property value. And it probably doesn't make enough of a difference for people who can't stand higher taxes, period. Um, you know, just are going to be, I don't care whether you're building a widget. Um, and as Matt we don't have very many of those. People are really want to invest in, and people are talking about housing values depend on a good school system that our Amherst and other colleges faculty move here, or, or the colleges woo them to come here because of what we're offering them as a community. So I, I just want to say that, I, you know, if there's a sense of the group on movement on this, I'm willing to move. I just want to make sure everyone understands that we took a big step when we went to five. That's the end of my statement. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, yeah, I I agree with Kathy's last point. I think that we're really, I, I agree with a lot of what Kathy just said, but I want to highlight the last point that, that she mentioned, which is that we keep losing the fact that 5 million from our reserves is a significant step right and and yes we would make that back ideally i'm i'm confident that we would make that back through inflation reduction act funds but it's still a significant step to go beyond that does make me really uncomfortable and i think that the reason is and i said this last night and i apologize that i'm repeating myself again but i feel um compelled to to say it again is that the the cost benefit here, the cost benefit here right the impact to our other projects specifically when we look at this the fire station and i recognize that DPW has been kind of put to the side in this conversation simply because we seem to feel like we have a common understanding of where the fire station is going to go. But regardless, you know, the impact to that project, the number of years that this gets pushed down the road with every million that we continue to take out of reserves, I'm extremely uncomfortable with. When we think about the, the way that we're, you know, uh, the way that people are, are playing with an amount that is impactful to many and 
seems to ignore impactful to many in terms of the payments for this for the debt exclusion, but seems to ignore the long term impacts on our fire station and our infrastructure. That's very concerning to me. I also wanted to to mention something that's been brought up to me a couple of times, which is that folks folks are saying, you know, well, won't we have those same Inflation Reduction Act savings for the fire station or for DPW? And maybe we will, but we're already, in my opinion, again, and I've only been on finance for a couple months, so bear with me if this is uninformed, but we're already under budget for those buildings, right? Totally. We're already, right. So so we're totally. going to need every ounce, thank you, I've got, that's very validating. Um, uh, we're gonna need every ounce of those reimbursements from the IRA on top of what we have saved. So for me, it's we are losing sight of the fact that we are already pushing ourselves really hard by taking this 5 million, even though it will get um, you know pulled back. And then I'm trying to recall uh, a conversation that we had about pulling aside the operating fund savings and applying those to the school, um, to the to the debt. And I feel like we had come to the conclusion that that was not possible. And I'm looking for converse, for confirmation on whether or not that's true. Sean, I think would be who I'm looking for conversation confirmation from. Um, it's not that it's not possible. It's not a decision I think you can make now. Okay. Um, it would be a decision when the new school opens and new budgets are updated at that time, if there's significant, um, you know, if there's, if there's the savings that have been projected or realized in terms of the staffing right. and the operation of the, of the um, school, it could be part of the budget guidelines, for example, um, for that year when the budgets are developed. Um, yeah. So I think it's, you know, because it's so far in the future and there's a lot that can happen between now and then, I don't see how you could vote something like that now, but. That's super fair. Thank you for clarifying. I think what's what's hard for me in hearing that is that I would rather those operational savings go back to the school's operating budget, uh, which we also know could use a big boost right now. But um, and that might be the I mean, again that might be part of your yeah. guidance in that year. Um, so I look forward to that conversation. But um, ultimately, that's that's where I'm at. And then I I also want to address the thing that keeps that that folks are using as the driver for this conversation which is understandable which is that you know we need to provide relief to folks who are feeling the the squeeze of of our tax payments and i do not believe that this mechanism is the best avenue for that we need to create a create a mechanism mm -hmm. whether it be through community development block grants i have to say the whole thing cuz the acronym always gets mixed up whenever i try to say it out loud um, or um, or cpa funding or something else whatever it might be that is the better mechanism to actually support the folks who need assistance taking more than the 5 million from our reserves regardless of the number over i believe that anything over 5 million isn't actually helping the populations that we need to be helping most in the most concentrated way. We can and we need to do that, and I am happy to commit to chasing that down the road, down the you know down the path to make it happen. Um, I will I will run on that, but I think that that's um, I think that's imp it's important to remember who we're actually helping and who we need to be helping. And pulling from our reserves ultimately hurts our overall picture and is not providing significant relief to the people who need it the most. Thanks. So let me get a little sense from the committee. Um, since I have to make a decision between going first to public comment and then seeing if Nate is available to present or the other way around, is there a preference from the committee? If Nate's if Nate's information is going to uh, influence our discussion in any public comments, we might be best to hear from Nate first. I don't know. I, I don't know if Nate can he is listening in. Yep, there you are. Um, so what the question that came up last night, Nate, uh, I thank you for being with us today, was that. Uh, counselors were asking questions about uh, the differences between uh, this uh, subsidized housing and uh, housing vouchers and uh, also some of the and, and what we know about vacancies. Um, I don't know if there are others in the committee who would like to add to the framing of the question but um, I know that there's several members of the council who are present um, in the audience at today's meeting and may be joining to um, get a little bit better sense of it. 
So, uh, Kathy, why don't you yeah, follow? I just, I just had to the list, Nate. So it was a question of the difference between the two. And also, is there a place you can go to just see if there are vacancies right now that are affordable units and get help applying? Then with CDBG, how much of that, and I know it's, but there's a public hearing and a decision on allocation, but is there a limit like you can't do more than half or or something to how much could be devoted toward rent subsidies? So that came up on how much of that budget could be devoted toward uh, uh, helping make housing more affordable. That was all I wanted to add to the list, Andy. On okay. it wasn't clear how much of it. Okay. You know. So why don't why don't we let uh, Nate start making presentation if that's okay with Anna and Lynn, and then um, uh, they can follow through with additional questions for Nate. Um, after he's uh, responded to the beginning, if that's okay with you, Nate. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'll. Um, I met with Sean a little bit too, so I have some framework for this. And you know, feel free to ask questions. So, <clears throat> I think, you know, there is a lot of um, nuance, or sometimes just you know, language differences in how people describe housing, and sometimes it, it's not meaningful. So, for instance, the state calls it the subsidized housing inventory. And that's you know the percentage of affordable units. It's the same accounting methodology across all towns, and they call it the subsidized housing inventory. You know SHI. It doesn't mean that all the units on there are subsidized. It's just it becomes you know that's kind of the common term because most of them do receive tax credits or some subsidy, but units on there don't necessarily have to get subsidized. So, you know sometimes we call it capital A affordable and lowercase affordable. So capital A affordable is something that's deed restricted. You know, is affirmatively fair marketed. It's monitored, um, and so those capital A affordable units are what's on the subsidized housing inventory. So any unit that has a deed restriction, you know, their rents are calculated based on the Springfield, um, a larger area, not just Amherst. So it's you know, it's a there's a larger area that um, the state uses to calculate what um, you know what the area median income is, and then there's a percentage of that. So say and a unit's affordable up to 80% of the area median income. And then, you know, there's a formula to say, well, you can't pay more than, you know, 30%. And that establishes what the rental maximum is for those affordable units. And so, you know, the tax rate in Amherst or in these towns doesn't necessarily affect that rent calculation because it's based on, you know, HUD in the state looking at an area for um, income. And those are capital A affordable. So a voucher uh, unit, a Section 8 voucher may or may not be um, capital A, oftentimes that's lowercase a, right? So a mobile voucher is something that, uh, say the housing authority administers a voucher and a tenant can go to market rate units and, and use the voucher, uh, you know, um, to make a certain amount of payment. And what we're finding in Amherst and what we've heard is that, you know, the, the rental amounts in Amherst is more than what a section eight voucher program can pay. And so, you know, a tenant can't pay, typically more than 30%, say 40% of their income to housing. And so if a tenant were to come off the waiting list in Amherst, which is about five to six years, they have 60 days to find a unit. And the housing authority, a tenant might look at a unit and they'll say, okay, here, I've found a unit, it's this much money. The housing authority might say, well, that is too much, right? The program, given your income, how much we can help pay, you know, how much money you'll get in your voucher, the unit is too expensive for you. And so they, the, the prospective tenant has to keep looking. And so in that case, it's, you know, there's really no protection for trying to keep those rents low. You know, our inclusionary zoning bylaw says that you can go up to 80% of the area median income, the AMI, and that's a standard. Um, and then you some at 60%, but 80 AMI is kind of the standard definition of affordable units. And in Amherst, 80% AMI is more expensive than say a section eight voucher holder can typically afford. And so, you know, through our local bylaw, we might, we do, we do have say, if there's so many units, you have to have some at 60% AMI and that's a lower, you know, um, median income calculation. And that would be um, affordable to someone with a section eight voucher. But, you know, the essentially the voucher program works within the market. It's not deed restricted or anything. So it's different than the capital A affordable units. Um, and you know, so that's and it's also difficult to get subsidy to a voucher holder. So typically, 
a voucher holder can't get a second subsidy. They can't kind of double dip. And so I know there's been mention of CPA and block grant programs, and there's probably some ways to assist a voucher holder, but it's it's a little more complicated um, than doing that. Uh, typically, too, even with the, say the block grant or CPA, um, we can't make payments directly to a, a tenant. You know, there's the anti-aid amendment, and so we had been. Um, with, you know, with housing trust money providing rental assistance, it was payments to landlords for tenants that, you know, say were income eligible or met certain requirements. And block grant can do the same thing. It's essentially a, you know, a monthly subsidy that goes directly to the landlord. It can be for um, utilities or for uh, rental amounts. There isn't um, in, a, in the block grant application, 20% of a grant, you know, so the town is eligible for 825,000 typically every year. 20% of that can go to towards social services. And that, you know, um, emergency rental assistance is considered a social service. And so we typically can fund up to five activities. So, you know, survival center, family outreach, Amherst Community Connections, you know, there's a number of agencies that apply every year. And the the kind of the practice has been historically and currently that the committee would recommend five social service activities. And those can range from, you know, anything like I said, survival center to helping Craig's doors. With rental assistance, we we can do that. We've done that in the past. Um, DHCD, I think, limits it to three months of um, expenses for um, a beneficiary. They don't like to see it as um, helping to pay like ongoing living costs. And so the program, you know, has some limits in terms of how much it can support a tenant or even a homeowner. But it, you know, there it is possible. We have used CPA money through Amherst Community Connections to also provide a similar program where we're providing almost like a local subsidy that um, ACCs have passed through. They you know, qualify tenants, make sure they're getting support services, are income eligible, and then there's payments of CPA dollars that are really then made to um, reimburse the landlord for a monthly expense. And so CDBG and CPA can assist with that. There are some you know, limits in terms of income eligibility and, like I said, the duration of payment. Um, but those those can help, and I, I I think that's it. I don't know if there's if I'm missing something, um, but feel free to ask any questions. Anna, thank you. So um, I actually had a question from another counselor, and Nate, thank you so much for that overview. That was really helpful. Um, I'm going to put this question out into the universe. I don't know if Sean is still with us because I'm at, I, I might wait until Sean is. Oh, Sean's here. Okay, um, you can keep your camera off, Sean. It's okay. Um, so the question from an, another counselor came in that what is the capacity of the hardship and tax deferral and the senior clause 41 C through 17 D would there be a cap on number of applicants or requests, how does this compare in terms of decreasing burden on qualified taxpayers compared to the decrease expected from five or 10 million from reserves, I'm hoping one of you can make sense of that and help me out with an answer yeah so my recommendation would be to send that to me in an email okay and I can distribute <laughs> that to everybody um it would i mean again the best person to answer that would be the the principal assessor okay. um who is the one who processes all of those every year um okay. so yeah if you send me that in an email like we can get you a full response by tomorrow awesome thank you sorry i was like i'm gonna just put it out there and see if one of you can answer it and otherwise i will uh great i'll email it to you thank you so much yep. Yeah, just make one quick observation, then call on Lynn next up. And that is that um, I don't, you know, there's been some discussion that we've had in a presentation of the council yesterday about the amount of increase that might come to a tenant uh, as a result of a tax increase or anything else. But, and that's the whole point is that the or anything else because we don't know what factors landlords consider. Um, they consider their expenses, but they also consider what the market will bear. Um, so I'm not sure that there's a perfect answer to that question. Lynn? One of the other questions that came up about housing, Nate, was how much of our affordable housing do we put Amherst residents' preference as the first preference sure so that's a state regulation that you know it's a local preference so there's um you know it's it's at the initial lottery or lease up so you can the regulations right now are up to 70 percent of the affordable units and so 
a local preference can be an applicant that lives in town, works in town, has school-aged children, and then there's a fourth category I'm, I can't think of right now. But, you know, there has been some discussion that a local preference is discriminatory, so that if, you know, you are trying to diversify um, who's a homeowner or a tenant, you know, if a community is um, mostly older, white, you know, households, you're not diversifying and offering opportunities to others. And so, uh, you know, it's it hasn't been confirmed by the state or by HUD that a local preference is discriminatory, but, you know, housing developers are asking for a reduction in that percentage. So, you know, it could be 50% local preference or something. And, um, you know, it's something that has been, you know, requested of staff and it's been, you know, we've been discussing it. So, you know, I think that in Amherst, we, you know, we often, when the town uh, had the request for proposal for Belchertown Road and East Street School, we asked that as part of the review criteria, a more competitive application or response would have extra marketing in different languages or extra local marketing to, you know, people of color or something. And so we, re, you know, the trust really wanted and the town wanted to have that extra outreach. And to me, that can help overcome, say, a local preference that may, some people may seem as discriminatory. So it is up to, you know, and it's only at initial lease up. And so, you know, after the initial lottery for units, uh, you know, there's an applicant pool that can maintain be maintained on a waiting list, but it's really just that initial lease up is where the local preference is used. And just to follow up on the, for example, the proposed ball lane development, right? Um, is there a local preference on that? And is that only on the initial buyer or is it over a period of years? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, local preference can be used for rental or ownership opportunities, and it's usually just on the initial lease up or the initial sale. And the local preference is really at the discretion of the local permitting board. So with a comprehensive permit, Ball Lane, you know, Valley CDC is looking to do 30 home ownership units. And so local preference could be that, you know, a certain up to 70%. It's, so it's, it's up to 70%. That's the maximum. The ZBA would make it a condition of the permit. And then the town has to justify it to the state, to DHCD and to the marketing agent. So every time there's a local preference request, we have to research the market conditions and write a letter. You know, it can be anywhere from like three to eight pages with, you know, statistics in terms of housing costs, demographics to justify that local preference. And so, you know, we've been successful doing that. I mean, some communities, for instance, if there wasn't, you know, if you, if you, you know, for instance, what if there really wasn't a need for um, studio, affordable studio apartments, you couldn't say, well, you know, let's have 70% of those be reserved for local preference. And so the state might say, well, maybe only 50%. So every time you ask for a local preference or you condition it as part of a permit, the town then just has to justify it. And the state has the ability to modify that percentage. But, look, you know, so for Ball Lane, it's something that would be considered during the permit process. Thank you. Kathy. This is this may stretch um, your knowledge, and I can find a, a direct source. But the state code for seniors has a circuit breaker that if either your property taxes and your water bills exceed a certain share of your income or your rent exceeds a certain share, um, it's a direct refundable credit that can actually wipe out the taxes you owe. But if you didn't even owe any taxes, you get all the money back. Um, and I discovered it by making a mistake on my mother's tax return where it said, you know, in this blank, put the rent you pay, but, you know, you're only going to get up to 5000 I put the whole amount in and suddenly this form appeared and she got a check. So do, do you know whether our senior center advises people on this um because the ink it goes up pretty high on the assessed value of the house and very high on the income um you know it's all it's just in the tax code do you know whether we do that kind of um you might be eligible for this you know i'm i'm not sure um i think if someone were to ask you know we would you know get back to them but i'm not sure if we advertise that you know, per se with a flyer or anything. So I, you know, I can look into that, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. And one other thing, I, Kathy, you had mentioned, you know, can someone look at where are there vacancies now in affordable housing? And so the state worked really hard to put together um, a website is called the housing navigator. And it, you know, it's supposed to be an, an active website where you can search by town and you can see what units are available. Uh, and it's supposed to show both, you know, 
all the affordable units and whether or not there's vacancies, what the rents are. And, you know, um, periodically the state asks for local representatives, municipal officials to verify that the website's active or accurate. And um, so, you know, Amherst, I think they had listed most of them, but it's something that, you know, they're still, you know, I think it'll be totally built out over time. I mean, it's active now, the website's, a, you know, it's live and it's online, but, you know, if someone notices something, you know, even today, if you go look and you say, wow, it's missing something, email me and then I'll communicate it with the state because, you know, it is, you know, essentially it's like, how do you manage hundreds of thousands of listings and they're, but they're trying, right? So I think they heard that it's really hard to know where do you even find affordable units. And so, you know, when we were doing the CPA programs with Amherst Community Connections, I mean, essentially we just had like three ring binders, Amherst Community Connections made them, you know, the housing authority might have them of just like, you know, uh, you know, one page of listing here's, you know, here's all the apart, you know, apartment here, apartment there in a certain radius. And it's just a, you know, but the minute you make it, it might be, it's could be out of date. And so the idea is that this website would be something that's maintained um, and, you know, it could be used, you know, it, hopefully it's becomes a really useful tool. And um, Kathy, can I just address yeah. your question real quick? Yeah. Um, I was just looking at the most recent edition of the Amherst Senior Spirit. Um, and there is a AARP tax aid program um, where there's a, it says it's free drop off tax preparation services. I think you have to schedule something. I can send this link out to everybody. Um, but it, it says appointments are available on Tuesdays ending April 11th. Um, and it talks about making sure everyone get work, gets the tax credits and deductions that they've earned. Um, so I think they do advertise things like that. Okay. Thank you. No, well, thank you. Uh, Vic, you have a couple of minutes because uh, what I might do, if it's all right with you, is just see if there's anybody in the public comments section who has comments or questions on um, this topic. I will. I want to limit it because I want to get under the rest of public comment and then get back to the committee. Uh, sure. So. Yeah, that's that's fine. So I know that we have one person whose hand is up now and it's somebody who I don't know the name of because it's with, attached to a telephone number uh, for anybody who's on including other counselors if you have any questions that you think we need to pose to Nate would be helpful um, or um, things of interest please let us know uh, by raising your hand and um, then I'm going to come af after that, uh, and I'm going to try and limit public comment to just about two minutes so that we can get through as much as possible. And uh, then we'll come back and do general public comment on all other matters. Uh, so uh, the person who has your hand up now, if it is regarding this issue, then please keep your hand up. Otherwise, uh, take it down. Anybody else okay. who'd like to ask a question on this topic or make a comment on this topic, please raise your hand. Hi. Um, so I I was asked to be unmuted. And um, yeah, you want to identify yourself just so everybody knows? Yeah, Vincent O'Connor, 175 Summer Street in Amherst. Um, so I, I just wanted to check with um, Nate on my understanding of the 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 housing affordability uh, problem I, I have I have comments I've, I'll save for the general part but on this my understanding is that um, for every place that there are subsidized units um, rolling green we get credit for 204 units even though only 72 are available for subsidy um, that are project-based, built-in subsidized units, and um, and if your income is below the the cutoff, you you can apply, and then you pay a per certain uh, percentage of your income to live in the apartment, um, and that's constantly monitored by yearly reports and so forth. Um, North Square, you have 130 units we get credit for, but only 26 are actually available as subsidized units. The rest of them, for example, I think the one bedrooms are $2,000 uh, a month. Um, the new units at Presidential, I think there's three to five that are subsidies. They have a separate company. And I know this because I, I'm involved in helping people find affordable housing, rental housing. Um, and 
they have a separate company and you file a very lengthy application with the separate company. Um, Caymans, which manages the rest of presidential, does not handle your application. So there are there are fixed numbers of units uh, for, you know, they're the the units at Longmeadow Drive at 12 Longmeadow Drive those are all subsidized and you have to be income qualified and otherwise qualified to get there but none of those are available for market rate rentals um and but the problem that i see with with housing in Amherst with rental housing is that almost all of the apartment complex if not all of them the the problem for Section 8 is when you, if you have a Section 8 subsidy, as I do, I can stay in the unit that I'm living in at Mill Hollow as long as I can find a way to pay the rent, even though the rent is above the entry level. But if you are moving to town, um, c coming here to finish college, to go to graduate school, and you have a Section 8, you have to find a unit where the entry level, where the 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 rental amount. Um, I mean, if you find a unit that includes heat and hot water, then the unit's monthly cost can be higher, but the total cost um, with a utility allowance has to be below a certain amount, or Section 8 will not will not allow you to move in. That is our problem because so many of the apartments in town, the older apartments, not the ones that have been built in the last 10 years, but the older ones essentially have essentially raised their rents uh, to the level of some of the newer ones. Uh, again, places that were $1,200 six to eight years ago are now $2,000 for a one-bedroom or two-bedroom apartment. Okay, Vince. Um, let, and that let, and that's really the essence of the problem, I think, in terms of affordability. Okay, let, uh, Vince, uh, I'm going to uh, let uh, Nate respond, and then uh, I'm going to ask for general public comment. And I know you want to. You were saying you wanted to come back. So, Nate, do you have any follow up on what Vince was just saying? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, he's right. So. Um... If you're in a unit with a voucher, you can, as long as you can make the payments, you know, you can spend a lot more of your income on housing. But when you're coming into a unit, you can't spend more than 40% of your income on housing. And so then, you know, given the rents in Amherst, you know, the housing authority, for instance, if they're administering a voucher, they would have your income, they'd have the rent amount, and they would do some calculations, and they would just say, well, that unit, you know, it's too expensive, and then, you know, find another unit. But if all the units are priced that high, then you know you're you're shut out of the market. Um, in terms of the subsidized housing inventory, he's correct that some of the units, you know, aren't affordable in developments. But that's that's statewide, right? That's not that's the way the system works. That's the uh, you know the methodology the state did with you know the 40B permitting. It's an incentive that if 20 or 25 in a multi-unit development, you know, multi-unit um, whether it's home ownership or mostly apartments, but in a multi-unit development, if you know twenty percent or twenty-five percent, depending depending on the affordability level, then all of the units count on the subsidized housing inventory. You know that's a state regulation, and it was meant to incentivize development of affordable housing. And so, you know, in almost any community, if they say they they're at thirteen percent and that's you know twelve hundred units, typically not all twelve hundred units are affordable or deed restricted capitally affordable. It might be. 20% of that, it might be 40% of that, it depends. And you have to kind of dig into the numbers, but that's true across, you know, the state. So if you, you know, go online and you Google DHCD subsidized housing inventory, they have a percentage list for every community. Well, you know, rarely is that percent, you know, directly represented by all those units being affordable. And so that's, you know, to me, it's, once you understand that it's not, um, you know, maybe it's misleading at first, but that's, you know, it was, it's meant to incentivize development because someone can, you know, get some percentage of affordable and have market rate, but it's just the way it's accounted. It's, you know, it's a common percentage across the state. So I'm not, you know, whether people think it's good or bad or misleading, that's just how it's recorded. And so we're, I'm not, I don't really have an opinion one way or the other on that. I mean, you know, and he's right. So like Long Meadow Drive or Olympia Oaks, all the units are affordable. So when there's 40 units, this all 40 affordable, you know, at, um, up at North Square, you know, there's, 
you know, 20% of the units are affordable. So it's 26 out of 132. That's just the way the project was permitted and financed. And, you know, could someone come in and say, I'm going to do 50% of the units be affordable? Sure, they could do all of them be affordable. It's really how, you know, um, how you can finance it, how a developer can finance it and make it feasible um, to develop and everything. So it kind of comes down to that. And it's also the level of affordability. So at North Square, the housing trust in the town asked if they could have units for, you know, 50% AMI and 60% and not 80, right? Have a deeper level of affordability. And that's something that happened through, you know, I think the town's encouragement and then through Beacon working with, their, you know, their subsidizing agents to be able to do that. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna bring one more person in on this topic and then I think we need to switch to the general uh, discussion so that we are conscious of our time. Carol Lewis uh, can, uh, we bring Carol in and. Uh, hi, Carol Lewis. I'm, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Housing Trust. And I just want to say everything Nate just said is absolutely true. And it also drives us crazy. We are working at creating a list that shows you not only what's the subsidized units, but what are the actual affordable units. And we hope that that is available in a kind of a some or other form now if somebody wants to see it. And also, we hope that we will make it available in a broader way before too long. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Okay, so um, Nate, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure we could go on a lot longer on the topic. And uh, I think the council through uh, probably another committee ought to be um, delving into the question a little bit more, but I think uh, Carol just represents the Affordable Housing Trust and we really count on them to be our primary spokesperson, but it was very helpful for the counselors on the committee and other members of the committee and other counselors who are here to hear your response. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. Appreciate it very much. And uh, so um, I'm going to, um, the question now for the general public uh, is if you would like to make public comment on the question that uh, we need to return to, which is the motion that is on the floor and um, I don't know if uh, either Athena or uh, Lynn would like to make sure that Paul's aware of what the motion is since he's now been able to join us in this other meeting. The motion was to ask the town manager to amend or if necessary, issue a new financial order that includes taking from capital st stabilization fund the amount of $9,287,465. Okay, so if, uh, you're okay with that. So uh, that is the motion on the floor. Uh, anybody with public comment, uh, please raise your hand and uh, we'll try and ask you to be brief so that we can get, um, the committee can get back to it, but we do wanna hear. So um, anybody, uh, it's, it's open for comment. And I guess, uh, is that Mr. O'Connor back with us? Yes, it is. Okay, so try and keep it to a couple of minutes, but please. Uh... Right, yeah. So I um, wanted to speak to two things. One is the actual uh, the actual in addition of uh, additional money, and the other is the, the, the project itself. I, I think this is, I mean, and a lot of credit goes to the committee, um, is this is the first clean elementary school project we've had in 30 years. The one that came forward on Old Farm Road in the early 90s was in the Fort River floodplain, and, um, and it also um, involved the closure of Mark's Meadow and, um, and the perception that it might become a school for Amherst Woods. And it, it was pretty soundly rejected by both the voters and the town meeting. And and the the previous iteration of having 750 students in two buildings at Wildwood, it, it wasn't just that Wildwood is a, a much more constrained site than Fort River, or that it would involve trying to build those two buildings while Wildwood continued to function as a school. It was that there was an enormous 
change in the structure and um, of of the elementary school that affected other elementary schools that that were not being physically touched, and that I think created a problem that became insurmountable. Um, this project is clean, and it is on a site that the school can be constructed without affecting the functioning of the existing Fort River School. Um, it has a lot of virtues to it, and, and none of the detriments that have happened with the previous two elementary school projects. There are no transformations of the elementary school system or, you know, laid upon it or so forth. And so that, to that extent, I think that the committee deserves an enormous amount of credit for bringing forward a much cleaner and um, and uh, effective project. Um, I, I did participate in the meeting last night and listened to all however many minutes after I joined um, until 10:15, and six members of the council voted in favor of an additional $5,000. And I think it became clear to me that the council itself, as a body, the certainly the great majority of the members of the council were quite certain that the initial $5,000 was going to come back. So this would be 5000 that might not come back, is not likely to come back. And all I can say is you know, this is the most crucial project. If this project fails, I, I can just say you should forget about all the other projects until you can bring this project back and make it succeed. Um, and I don't want us to go through the same process we went to, through in 1994. We had to bring back the high school renovation and expansion, which I spent six weeks of my life trying to undo a 72-vote defeat uh, in June of, uh, of 94 and turn it into a victory. Um, and I think the way to accomplish that, perception is everything in politics. And I think that putting in $5 million that you are on, on top of the $5 million that you know you know, with 95 or 98 percent certainty that you're going to get back, to put an additional five million, supported already by six members of the council. Um, perception is everything. I think that it is better to to do what you can to make this thing pass on the first go round, than to have to come back in the fall with a second go round. I think. It would not be helpful, and this this is a perception that you are trying to – you can analyze how much or how little money is going to – but that's not the issue. The issue is perception, and it is important that the public perceives that you are doing whatever you can to help this thing pass. And I would urge the Finance Committee, as I think – already given the motion the maker of the motion um, that the council seems to be on record with a majority um, in favor of the additional amount of money okay. and I Please urge the finance committee to uh, to uh, to support their uh, their efforts okay. that's thank you needed to uh, but I appreciate your comment thank you uh, Dorothy's hand is up. I'm just going in order. Hi, Dorothy Hi. Pang, uh, 229 Amity Street. Um, I'll try to be very quick. I do agree that the school plan is superior and it is much more family friendly and does not involve breaking up siblings. Um, but we keep talking about the four capital projects and we're really in deep. We have the fifth capital project, which is roads. And people know that we're working on it and we have to work on it for a long, long time. But I just wanna speak up now for a group of people, retirees who have no children in the school, but so far, most of them have been responding to the vision of Amherst. 
as a place with a superior educational system and an intellectual, cultural, artistic capital. Um, and you know, this is the vision that we have to understand. We have to keep that part of the voting public with us on this because they are the group of people most likely to go and vote, okay? Particularly when you have it at a weird time. So the other thing about the school I wanna mention, this is to my mind really superior from the first version because it's a post COVID design. It understands the importance of being able to bring in air, light and have outdoor recreation and to be able to continue school, whatever the epidemics may be flowing here and there. Um, but I really want to say, have you really thought about those who do not want to give the additional five million? Have you thought about what happens if the vote fails? Um, I came to town when it, when the school when everything was very divisive, and then the school vote failed. It was not. It made me think I don't ever want to get involved in public life in Amherst, and it took me a number of years before I realized I was going to have to get involved. Um, we have to pass this vote. It is absolutely essential. All of the other projects depend upon a town that feels successful of able to pass a major project and to do it without uh, friends turning into enemies. Um, so I mean, I agree that when I was on the finance committee, I loved the idea that there was money in various places, that there was a conservative, uh, what I call hidey holes, uh, that there was a thought about times can change, things can go bad, but we're not saying that we wanna strip all of them, okay? There still be Amherst's finances are in good order. They are being managed very, very well. And I, I don't want to think anyone to think that because if we vote to give the 10 million to the school that we're being fast and loose with the money because we're not. Um, so I just want to say that if you want to stick to your conservative finances on this issue, our first big major capital project, you have to think about how much of a gambler do you want to be because we don't control the vote. The vote is out there. The voters are going to make up their mind. And I'm not a big sports fan, but I've been following the um, basketball games. And if you're in a basketball game and you're playing, you know you're going to win the game you're in. You don't say, well, I'll let this one go by, but I'm going to win one later because you'll be out of it. Your, your team will be out of the whole thing. We have to really put a, together a program which tells the town we are together. The council is together. We are not divided. We're going to move forward on this and we're going to use the resources that we have in order to keep Amherst as the town that it is a place of superior education and concern for its children. So I do hope that you would support Lynn's motion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we have one more person who's asked for public comment, Jenny. Hi, all. Thank you, Andy. This is a very brief comment. Uh, thank you for all for your work. I'm very excited about the school. I just wondered whether there was any possibility that the Finance Committee could meet at a time where Councillor Walker, who has so much input that is important to hear based on last night and other meetings, if there's any possibility whatsoever that the next finance committee meeting uh, could include her. And I think it would be very meaningful to many of us who are following the debate. Uh, so this may be very difficult, but just a suggestion, if at all possible. That's all. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so let me just respond to that last comment real quickly and then get to the committee for discussion of the motion that's on the floor. Uh, and, but uh, uh, if, you may, if you missed the beginning of the meeting, what I said is that uh, at the conclusion under uh, 48 hour notice rule where we're allowed to take up things, we're not anticipated 48 hours in advance. We, uh, the committee is gonna talk about how it can find a different schedule for meetings uh, to accommodate uh, Councillor Walker, uh, Alicia did not uh, inform us until last night's meeting that she would not be able to attend today, so that it was um, it, it too late to reschedule today's meeting. But we are very conscious of that, and uh, for the exact reason that uh, you've indicated. So thank you for bringing that to us. So going back to the uh, committee then. I think we know what the question is on the floor. Uh, I don't know if uh, anybody has additional comments that were not made before. 
Um, I, uh, yes, uh, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of echo what um, Anna and Kathy and others and Bernie have said in, in that. Um, I, I do think that the issue of affordable housing and the issue of how much we should put of reserves into the school building are really two separate issues that have gotten confounded. Um, and and I, I, I'd like to separate them out. And I agree with Anna that I think if we can work on affordable housing um, with other initiatives, um, but we have to think about not just this building, but other the other uh, capital projects as well. And so, um, I think as the finance committee, we should recommend what we think is in the best financial interest of the town. I re recognize what, what Dorothy said, which is having listened to the meeting last night, there's a political issue here and there's a perception here that, that somehow we're not spending enough money on this project and we should spend more reserves on this project in order to reduce taxes. That's a that's a political issue. And I don't think this committee could get into political issues. I think we should focus on financial issues and make a recommendation. Council can take our recommendation or they can make a decision that differs from our recommendation. That's their prerogative. But I don't think we should think of the politics versus the financial implications. Thanks. Okay, um, Anna? It, you can go to Bernie first if you'd. Okay, Bernie, if I, you had spoken before, but please go, Bernie, if you. Uh, thank, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Andy. Um, in my previous stint as an elected official, um, in another town, um, I was part of a group that built two new schools and planned a third. And um, I can tell you that going through a school building project this time as a, an appointed finance committee member is a lot more fun because I don't get to, to worry about being reelected to anything. Um, one thing that always happened was is we always got, as we were do, going through those school projects, um, we got phone calls from realtors saying, is the school going to go? Is the school going to be built? You know what that means? Um, so if anything, the new school might actually increase property values in town and compound um, some of the challenges that we're, we're already facing. I can't see how 23 or 25 cents a day for the average homeowner in Amherst is going to do anything to alleviate the shortage of housing. It's not. I agree with Bob that these two issues have gotten convoluted. Uh, if we have an issue with, with uh, the census uh, says that only 45% of the housing in Amherst is owner occupied. Uh, the census also says that the typical person um, over age one has lived in town 49% of the typical people in town uh, have only lived here for a year. So there's a lot of churn, a lot of turnover. It's a complicated situation. Again, another $5 million um, isn't gonna help create housing. It isn't gonna keep people from moving out of town. It might even induce people to move into town. Um, I understand that politics is, is perception. Uh, there's a great deal of effort in that. There's a great deal of theater that goes into to, to, to politics and to meetings. Um, I understand that. But again, $5 million isn't gonna change it. Uh, I, I'd also like to mention that the previous school project was um, approved by a majority of the voters. Uh, and well, this is a great project. I, I want to reiterate, I'm in favor of this project. I want to see it built. I think it would be a tremendous mistake not to do it for the sake of the kids and for the sake of other projects. I will not uh, agree with adding additional funds um, 
stabilization funds to, uh, to, to buy down the cost of the project because we need that money elsewhere and it's not gonna make any difference in the, uh, the challenge of housing that people keep raising. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I think I wanna add something to what Bernie said and he doesn't need to endorse that, but 5 million does go a long way towards the other capital projects that we have planned. Um, whereas when you spread it out the way that we've talked about it, it doesn't quite doesn't quite go as far. Um, I had a I had one quick comment based on on what we heard at public comment that I believe is a quick sort of factual correction, if that's okay, Andy. And then I had a couple comments that um, other counselors had sent me to ask if now is an appropriate time for me to ask those. Okay, why don't you go with both? Okay. So the first one is that the the motion that the council voted on last night was for the finance committee to consider the additional 5 million, it wasn't to actually add it, it was for the finance committee to discuss it and have that discussion. And so I wanted to clarify that that, um, and, and a number of people abstained from that vote. And so I don't actually think that that um, was a vote, sorry, that that was a vote to approve that amount. And so I wanted to just clarify because the, the public comment um, indicated that it was a vote for finance to, to endorse that. Um, and I, I did not interpret that motion as such. Um, so the questions that I have, I believe, are mostly directed at Sean um, or maybe Paul. So first question. Oh, my gosh, I lost it all. OK, first question is how much money has the town contributed thus far to the uh, elementary school building project? So maybe it's easier if I just break down the funding sources. Um, okay. So of the. Uh, $99.2 million total project budget. $280,000 um, has already come from free cash that was used to fund the increase in the feasibility study costs. Uh, $750,000 is coming from general fund debt, so not a debt exclusion, but from our, our, capital, our capital budget. $700,000 is coming from uh, CPA. And so those are the sources that are set at this point, um, somewhere around 1.7 million. Thank you. Um, second question you already told me would need to go to the assessor. Third question, and, and this counselor did say they weren't sure how to frame this one, so bear with me. Um, would any of the other options presented last night have equal or a greater decrease as would removing five or 10 million from reserves? If so, what would a timeline look like and how would they add up in terms of a guarantee in compared to the first million? I can get further clarification on that. Yeah. I'm totally sure what it's asking. Okay. Um, and then the- so, so we did present option one, option two, option three yeah. um, in terms of the level of reserve use. Um, so maybe if you read that question again with, okay. with me having that frame. Sure, okay, so it says, would any of the other options presented last night have equal or greater decrease as would removing five or 10 million from reserves? If so, what would a timeline look like and how do they add up in terms of guarantee and compared to the first 5 million? So it sounds like that question's in regards to maybe alternative options that were not presented last night. Um, and yeah, so that I would need to think about. Okay, um, last one. I think you've kind of answered this, uh, is what is the minimum amount prudent for our reserves? How low can we go? So again, um, so the history of our reserves, the finance and, and Andy, feel free to, to contribute. Um, for the longest time, our policies were between five and 15%. Um, when the, it was determined that we had significant capital needs, including building projects, um, there was an effort to grow reserves even beyond that. Um, when we've been looking, uh, when we created the capital stabilization fund, we adopt, uh, adapted that to try to target 15% between free cash and general stabilization, and then anything above that for the reparation stabilization fund, and then the capital stabilization fund. Um, and as I've said in the past, the, the reason why we target 15% for free cash and general stabilization is that when we have our bond rating meetings, um, one of the factors they look at is our budgetary flexibility. And what they mean by that is how much we have basically in reserves. Um, and the best score we get is for 15%. Um, so it's one 
factor. It's not the only factor, but it's one factor that contributes um, towards keeping our bond rating where it is. Um, and and so we want to do everything we can to keep our bond rating where it is, and if possible in the future, um, get a, a upgrade in our bond rating. Thank you. I think that's it. Hey, yeah, the uh, uh, five to fifteen percent <clears throat> was created uh, when we developed the um, not current but the prior version of the town pilot financial management policies and it was developed by the old finance committee under the uh, working with the then finance director and uh, the five to 15 percent arose from that process and became part of those policies and I think that it was recommended by the finance director probably because uh, he was conscious of the point that Sean has made about the relationship between the policy and uh, the bond rating. But uh, we've, we're con fairly consistent in staying with those ranges uh, until we made the decision that we um, needed to do these four building projects, which was for the first elementary school project which is the one that failed, uh, was put forward and uh, it was part of a for building plan. The reason I want to say that is that I'm not going to just say what I'm thinking. I think that there are two separate issues actually here. One is the motion on the floor, which we do have to get back to and vote on. And the value of the motion that um, has been made and seconded it would be that it would give the council the capacity to make a decision and it's sort of uh, an action that we could take to recommend something to the town manager that would give the town manager um, uh, direction if he chose to take it um, to um, revise the order and make the order something that gives the council a full range of options because if it's uh, the order stands as it has been previously submitted, um, we now um, are, uh, depending upon final advice from town attorney, not going to be possibly in a position where the council could choose to increase it above the amount that's uh, stated in the order, which is was based on the 5%, which was the last vote of this committee. So I separate that out from the other question, which is, should the committee uh, make a recommendation, which may be a, sec a separate motion entirely, or could be done by just saying that we want to make sure that uh, the views of the committee are presented but um, I think that I would be inclined to say that we should make the recommendation. I think that's why we're here. And uh, I'm consistent, uh, I think, with uh, most of the other comments because I, I said it last night that I, looking at the building plan, don't believe that we can move forward with the fire station and the DPW building. And we may have to do the DPW building first because it is in far uh, even worse state uh, as far as the conditions of the building and what we're asking people to work in and their health than even the fire station is, which just shows you how bad it is because both of them are buildings that are sorely in need of replacement and uh, the ability to um, complete those two projects would be delayed um, by a fairly substantial period of time if we um, take what was the entire stabilization fund for capital that has been built up for that purpose and take it and uh, use it for this uh, uh, other purpose. And I would do it 
if I thought that there was a risk to not being able to complete the school project, because that certainly is the one that we're dealing with now, and it is a high priority, and I think that it would be um, a financial disaster for the town if we lose that project. But uh, I still uh, have great faith in the voters of the town of Amherst, always have, and that when they look at the numbers and realize that the reduction of the amount of the increase that they would be voting on would be less than a dollar a week, you know, or like 60, 70 cents a week for most, for the average homeowner, it would vary, obviously, depending upon the price of the house. Um, and for renters, uh, uh, it's, as I noted earlier, not something we can know with certainty, but um, when dividing up the additional rent by the number of units would be even a much smaller amount. But I just don't think that um, they are going to say, oh gosh, just $40 is really going to uh, make it impossible for me to pay the increase. I think they're going to make the decision to pay the, whether they can afford to pay the increase uh, on the whole amount, whether there's a reduction or not, uh, that it isn't enough to make a difference. So I would be inclined, um, both because of the extreme jeopardy this places the other projects in and the um, what we know is the delay in the cost that would be there and the uh, very high possibility that if we do this uh, with the full amount of the stabilization fund gone, we're going to have to come back to the voters again for another override anyway, or debt exclusion, because we would need a debt exclusion uh, possibly to complete those last one of those last two projects, and in the end, then um, our taxpayers aren't going to save any money at all. So, for all of those reasons, I think that if we vote yes on the first motion, um, I still think we should uh, have a second motion in which we take a very strong position on making a recommendation along those lines. So now I'm going to get off of making my own comments and get back to chairing. And uh, I will, I guess that Kathy is uh, next. Yep. I, I, Andy, I just want to uh, uh, modify a bit what you've just said. The first five million, we talked through and we actually had, we, we voted on it and we voted on us second motion that the intent is when we get the direct credits back from the federal government, they go back into the stabilization fund. So we are not taking the whole stabilization fund. That So you stated as if we just wiped it out. We didn't wipe it out. And I will be the first to admit, we don't know how much of that five comes back. Um, but, but I think um, financially, I think it actually gives us a lot of flexibility because the way that the IRA direct payment works is if you finance it with a municipal bond, you don't get up to 30%, you just get 25%. If you pay for it, you get a full 30. You know, so they're, they're asked, you know, so if you're, if we're paying for the solar, for example, and one of the nice things, um, this is getting too much into the weeds for everyone probably, but the school, if we if the school moves forward, it gets built. It's we don't need to buy the solar until 2025 because you can't put it on a roof until you have a roof and you can't put it on a parking lot. And we talked with our design team and we could separately contract for that. I mean, they have to design it, they have to get it ready. So it'll it allows Sean in the finance department a flexibility to figure out the cash flow on all of this, um, rather than assuming everything is long-term debt. 
So that was one of the reasons I thought this was a good a good financial proposition. So I just want to correct that if if we're talking about um, Lynn worded it to be all because but we're talking about an additional amount above the five with a big chunk of the original five coming back. And I think that's important when you said separate the issues. That's, I think we're coming back to this discussion to say, are we staying with five? Or are we going higher? Is a simpler way of, of me reframing it. Um, so but that's it. You know, I just, when I was doing the math on, if I multiply 30% times the cost of the solar versus 25, it, it matters in terms of the amount of credit we get back. That's it. Okay, thank you. And I do stand corrected. And I appreciate the, the correction that you made. Um, I did vote for the original proposal um, because I thought that the funds were coming back and I had confidence enough in the uh, likelihood that they would be there. So it was not a question of taking them out of uh, reserves forever, but sort of being able to finance the construction in order to qualify for the um, inclusion of the pieces that would then allow us to um, apply for the money that could come through that particular program. Uh, Lynn? Let me play out a scenario. And in part, Andy, it actually um, is also a correction. If the Finance Committee votes not to support this motion today, it means that it will go to the Council on Monday. And if they then want to increase it, depending on what we learn from our town attorney, it may start the process completely over in terms of posting a public forum and coming back. Part of the reason, not the only, but part of the reason I made the motion I did today is because I would like to put the decision in the hands of the council. At the same time, I'm probably more fiscally conservative than most of the other people sitting on this committee. And I didn't make this motion lightly. I made it so that the council, with the advice of what the consequences of this vote may mean, and I can go into those, though many have been mentioned here, that they make the decision. But if we vote this down in the meeting tonight, today, then it has to come back on Monday to the full council and if they, we find out we can't just amend a financial order on the spot, then it has to be reissued as an order by the, uh, pre by the town manager and then go through the process, unless we've learned something since the meeting has started. Sean? Well, uh, just one more scenario would be if you voted down today, you could vote on the $5 million order as it currently exists, you could vote whether to recommend or not recommend the existing order, and then it would go for the hearing, you would, the Finance Committee would decide if they want to change their recommendation um, on that vote after the hearing, and then the council would consider that and vote yes or no on that. Um, so again, you, you could take the existing order and proceed with it. Um, ultimately, it's, you know, it's up to you whether you want to, you want us to look into the, we're going to look into either way, the possibility of amending it up. Um, but the normal course of action would be to take the order we have and have it be voted on by the finance committee either to recommend or not recommend. And so again, I want to say, by us not voting on the motion that I made, we either take the decision out of the hands of the council because they don't get to amend it to go up, or the council does the same thing that my motion did today which is to increase the amount we take from stabilization. And they can vote it down on the third, but if they have to go back and then our town attorney says, oh, by the way, that starts a whole new process because that is on a whole financial order. We have to reset our public form. Now, we still have many days between now and May 2nd, 
but I want to just mention ballots go out this coming the for sometime around the end of the first week, the beginning of the second week of April. So, and we know that in Amherst in the last election by November, 50% of our population voted by mail. So this is not a decision that's going to get made on May 2nd. This is a decision that's going to get made probably way before May 2nd. That's not to discourage people from going to the polls on May 2nd, because you could change the vote. But 50% of our population voted by mail. So we're, my goal was to provide the, count, the full council with full financial advice, but to also give them the option of either going with the 9 million plus or going back to five or going back to zero. That's where I was going. And while I'm at it, I also want to just say, I agree with what Andy said. We may have to go out for another debt exclusion or even a straight out override. If that's what we have to do to fix our roads, to build something else. But that's the risk we take by cleaning out our hard developed reserves. It's risk, it's risk. I don't care which way you go, it's risk. This is a plan we've been trying to get done for so long. Other things interceded. This is where we are today. I don't hear anybody on this whole group here or probably anybody sitting in our audience that doesn't feel we need this school. So my goal is to get this school built and my goal is to let the council have all the options and to provide them with good financial advice. John, were you gonna contribute something or? Okay, Anna? Yeah, Lynn, I think some of the things that you just said are mutually exclusive. I don't think that we can, I, I'm very uncomfortable with the idea that we have to vote in the affirmative on a recommendation that's not sound financial advice. Again, that's my opinion, but that's not sound financial advice. It feels like it's holding the finance committee hostage to allow the council to have an option. And I'm very uncomfortable with that. I think that you know the, this committee is responsible for providing the council with what we believe to be the best finance financial advice that we can. Um, and for us to vote in the affirmative simply to give the council something else to discuss is not actually following that responsibility. So I'm very uncomfortable with that. Um, the other part that I, I don't understand that's from a process angle is that, you know, the, the council voted last night to have this committee discuss the, the possibility of increasing the, um, the amount from reserves to 10 million. I feel that we have had a very robust and informed discussion today on that topic. And I think that that's, you know, in my mind, what we should be making that, that recommendation or not. I'm also a little perplexed as to whether it has to be a recommendation in the affirmative. So I think that that's my question for Sean or Paul is, you know, it asks for a finance committee recommendation. Does it have to be a positive recommendation or is it just asking for the opinion of the finance committee? Um, because I, I think that that is also telling, right? And I think that for it to only be a positive recommendation, that's the part that's making me very uncomfortable. Um, and feeling like we're weirdly holding this committee to doing something just so the council can debate it, which is not appropriate in my mind. Anna, when you say it requires, what, what do you mean the process so, or? Yeah, so, so my interpretation of what Lynn just said was that if we don't vote in the affirmative for the motion that she made, the council can't have any discussion or debate okay. on that topic. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually don't understand that because with the reparation fund, it came out of finance with one recommendation, then it was changed in the council. Um, it was changed, increased. It wasn't decreased. It was increased. So I think if there's sufficient confusion, um, again, the, the we'll look into this, but the meeting Monday night is a finance committee meeting. Um, right, it's a joint meeting in, uh, between the finance committee and the council, which can yeah. be a public forum first. Um, if there's sufficient confusion, it, it may make sense not to vote this now, but to let Paul and I find out um, 
what are the options? And then the finance committee could choose to take an action Monday night after the forum um, as part of their piece of the meeting. Um, once we have all of the options, because it, it feels like there's sufficient confusion at this point. <laughs> um, and I'd rather not vote something that then we find out is um, you know, not what you were intending to do. Yeah, I, I would, I, speaking for myself, I would appreciate that because I think that there have been plenty of times where you know, things have been referred to finance for a recommendation, and that could mean either a positive one or a negative one. Um, but but it's a recommendation. It's it's feedback, and so I I would be more comfortable hearing that um, before making a decision. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I I just wanted to. Uh, I think um, we're all in violent agreement now, but I, I think. Um, I, I, I want to make sure we don't send mixed signals to the council. Um, I think if we uh, if we approve the motion, it's approving increasing it. And then if we could come back and say, but we don't really recommend this, we really recommend something else. I, I think that's just going to be, people are going to read that, each counselor is going to read that the way they want to read that. And it's not really coming, it's not this committee making a recommendation to the council. So I, I'm uncomfortable with uh, with where, I, I'm uncomfortable voting, or I don't vote, but recommending this motion um, because I think it would send the wrong signal. Okay. Um, one thing before I get back to you, Kathy, because uh, since I've, I want to respond to you and then you can respond to me back. Um, I We may have made a mistake in the last um, time we did a transfer into a stabilization fund for the reason that you have stated, though um, there was a difference too, because we were not, it was not attached to a budget. It was about funding a stabilization fund only, which, but this is recommending a budget for the construction of a building and the budget falls under um, through the budgeting rules uh, of chapter 44, section 32. So this is, becomes another question for uh, just for clarification, if we haven't had a conversation with Lauren Goldberg yet, which is whether there was a difference in the process because um, this involves a budget and that last one didn't, or did we make a mistake the last time? And do we need to, is there something defective that we need to be aware of about? Andy, which which one are we talking about? Uh, which one are you? That's... The, the, the decision that was made, we made a recommendation on the amount to transfer into the, um, the the stabilization fund for reparations. Did that and not come from that ultimately did it not? I but I think though what Kathy's point was and that my recollect I yeah, I don't I can, recall it as I, well, but you seem to recall that yeah we 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 voted up to $1 million out of the committee. And when it went to the council, it went, it was amended to go up to $2 million. So, yeah, so that was an advisory vote. That wasn't an appropriation order. If you remember, it's it's up to, it's to tell Paul essentially that um, gotcha. every year when there's, um, okay. when we do our free cash transfers, um, if the town has is in good financial standing, that we would transfer an amount up to, and again, that is, that is not an appropriation order. So it wouldn't follow the same, it okay. wouldn't be applicable here, but I get your point why it's confusing, but that's a different type of vote. Okay, so I have kind of a simplistic question. The appropriation order that Sean saw on the screen, I think are we are you unanimous that we at least want that. So we were asked to vote on that today, I think, going in. So what and in effect, we kind of have voted on that already because we earlier voted on the five million and all the others are pieces. We also voted on CPA, you know, we we but we've never voted on the whole uh, 
magnificent whole. So <laughs> in all its glory. So do we need to at least vote on that today in a, this looks good. And then what, what's being asked is the question of that line that says five, does the line that says five go bigger? Can that be a full council decision? That is what, that's what's being asked um, rather than, and then do we, out of this discussion, I'm willing to take a vote on whether we want a, a recommendation that says we don't advise to go higher, you know, separate from the vote on the order <laughs> or, um, and um, I'm not, I, I have my own thoughts of how I'm gonna vote on that, but if we want to say that, and, uh, X out of Y of us who were here in today's meeting uh, think five is a good number, you know, that we shouldn't go higher. So I just, I don't want to leave a loop. Paul, you understand what I'm saying? I don't want to fail to say, you know, we at least all approve this. Um, and is this the time? Because that's one of the things I thought we were going to do. Um, at least when I'm saying at least this. Um, so can someone kind of help me with this? Because I would like, you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't realize that there was a lot of approval of the five um, and it never came to the full council. It just got quickly referenced. Well, yeah, and I'm sorry, I missed the first hour, so this may not be appropriate, but it seems like what the, what the finance committee could do is take a motion, take a vote on the motion as that was presented, which has the 5 million period, right? So that moves that forward. And then I think you promised last night that you would vote on another number, i.e. 10 million. And I think you, Kathy and Lynn agreed that you would put that motion on the floor. We could have a companion motion that would recommend that the town manager increase that amount from five to $10 million. And then, then the finance committee will have acted on that. Sean and Athena, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think the first piece definitely makes sense. I think the second piece, again, would be sort of advisory to you. Um, and then again, the Finance Committee is going to have a chance to change its vote after the public forum. So we will have answers by that point. So if you wanted to vote on the, the order as it stands, um, from a process standpoint, it would make me feel better because when we go out for large borrowings, we have to show that it was presented to the council, it was referred to the finance committee, the finance committee reviewed it, and then there was a public forum. And you know, so we have to show these steps in order to make sure that everything is um, in proper order. And, and so typically that means there's a recommendation vote from the finance committee. Um, so so I, I think the way you described it is, is something that could work. And we will be vetting this with our town attorney tomorrow, just so we'll have an answer tomorrow from the town attorney. And I did, I, you know, just, I think I was clear, but, you know, normally we said, I make a motion to recommend authorization number, blah, 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 all those numbers up at the top of this thing. And instead, we're just talking about one line down, down in the middle of it. So far, right. that's what but, we've been talking about. But we would, yeah, but we would look for you to do the, the way you described okay. it in the beginning, which is to to recommend to take a to take a vote on um, order uh, financial order FY twenty three dash oh six C is the order number. Okay. So we've now come full circle with uh, probably. Yeah, I'm sorry if I come, come, but I thought at a minimum, can't we do that? I feel like we've left, you know, th that one. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I agree that we should do that. But we do have a motion on the floor. Yep. yep. And the motion on the floor was to amend that order, essentially, to increase the amount to the full amount available in capital stabilization fund and make that recommendation to the manager. Can I move that that motion be put aside? Was the maker of the motion, uh, unless Athena, unless Athena had to leave, um, the maker of the motion, oh, no. the motion can decide to pull the motion. <laughs> no, I'm not pulling it. I'm not, I'm not withdrawing it. I'm actually just putting it to the side. This is where I need Athena. 
I think once there's a motion on the table, you have to act on that motion. You can't just say, oh, we're going to do this other thing first. Okay. Unless you table the motion. Unless you table it or. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then reintroduce it yeah. later. Okay, then I'll table it. I think that has to be a motion. I, mo I move to table the motion. And you're, you're tabling it till this meeting, right? We're still gonna be coming back to it. <laughs> well, no, I actually probably am tabling it until after the... Um, um, I would table it until after the public forum. I, I would like... I'm, I'm, I'm just what thinking I'm about hearing what we heard the other night, Lynn, that what was the uh, direction that uh, Tina gave the a motion to postpone to a definite date is different from a motion to table. And did you really so wouldn't the motion really be to, to postpone it until Monday? Yeah. I'm I'm not stopping debate. Uh okay. I move that. The motion that's on the table be postponed until after the public forum on Monday, April 3rd. Did Bernie, do you have, are you trying to give me help here or, or whatever? Yeah, I'm searching back through uh, Roberts and, and yes. too many hours of meetings with Bob Ritchie. Um, yeah. I, I really think that um, you, you, you could just, we could just take the motion off the table now and you can always reintroduce it at the meeting, um, the finance committee meeting after the hearing. So whether you want to do what you're trying to do now or just say um, have the committee vote to table the, the, the motion, it can make a, a, a reappearance in the next. Um, My major problem is that it means I've already said it. It. It means that whatever the council does on Monday, we have to get legal advice, which we're going to have to do anyway. So um, I'm going to just, um, I don't want to withdraw this motion, but I also don't want it to. Um, what if you move to postpone just what you just said? Okay, I move to postpone the vote on this motion until after the public forum on April 3rd when the finance committee reconvenes. There's a second on that. Kathy seconded. I'll second it. So since yeah. I, I just yeah. want to hear from Paul and then. Uh, yeah. I, I just want to make sure you feel you've honored what you said you were going to do last night. <laughs> last night, we said the motion that was given to us last night was that we, the finance committee would discuss the option. We did not say that we would vote on the option. No, no, I think you and Kathy both said you would make a motion or something. And I did. I made a okay. motion okay. at the very beginning of the meeting and Kathy seconded it. And the okay. only difference for the record, the only difference in the motion was that prior to that, I asked Sean what was the amount in the capital stabilization fund. Mm -hmm. And that is the number I used versus 10 million. Okay, thank you. So uh, going to a vote, uh, I'll just do it alphabetically by uh, last name. Andy, um, can you, I'm so sorry. Could you repeat which motion is actually on the floor right now? Thank this you. is the motion to uh, postpone action on the original motion on the floor until after the uh, forum on the third. Thank you. I vote aye. Lynn? Aye. Bob? Support. Matt? Support. Uh, Bernie? Support. Kathy? Support. Uh, support. Yes. I get to vote. Yes. Yeah, and I'll do yes. And Alicia is absent. So it is. Four to zero of the voting members with one voting member absent and the support of three uh, non-voting members that uh, this be postponed until after the forum.
So I think that the that the next motion be for um, to support the order uh, to recommend the order as uh, presented. Uh, I'm willing to make that if Sean puts it up so I can read the right letters again. I move that the Finance Committee recommend that the Council support an order authorizing construction of a new school at the Fort River School site and appropriation and borrowing authorization order FY23 06C. As presented. Is there a second? Second, Devlin Gothia. Okay. And. Um... That is both, but that, that that is a budget motion, and uh, so just be clear about what we're doing. Any further discussion on the motion on the floor? Okay, seeing no request for discussion, um, let's uh, start with uh, Lynn this time. Just go down one. I support this motion as my minimum. So it's a yes vote? Yes. Bob? Support. Matt? Support. Ernie? Support. Kathy? Yes. And I'm a yes. Uh, Felicia's absent and Anna? Yes. Aye. Okay, same vote on four to zero. One member voting member absent and support from the three resident members. So I don't think that we require to take any other action. Uh, writing this up is going to be a real challenge, but I'll do my best and try and do this one in time to uh, get it out for comment. I apologize that I was unable to do that with the last report. Uh, so the only other thing that I have wanted to um, bring up, because I'm not gonna try and take up, uh, we don't actually have anything other, we don't have, minutes on the agenda anyway, I ask so we not do that tonight. Um, under not anticipated, um, is there any guidance that you can give me or about times um, that uh, we can propose to meet as alternatives? Um, because I, what I was- I, I oppose- just, yeah, I posed the question to Alicia, and I've not received an answer. And, and the other thing, Andy, it would have to be interactive when with when other committees meet too. So just and yeah, Andy, it, I I mean I'm happy to share. I have a job that I'm currently I need to work hours after hours because I I leave a half an hour and a half early on. Uh, count on these on finance committee days. So I have to make up that time at some point. So um, I, I think that for me, it's really about if you ask us giving kind of a little bit of lead time so that I can adjust my schedule accordingly as needed. But generally, I mean, I, I work 8.30 to 4.30 or 5 most days, but um, I can be slightly flexible, but lead time is important. It's hard for me to switch one week to the next. Yeah, I want to find a good permanent time but from your perspective, doing an evening meeting, if we could find a night that doesn't conflict with other committees. It's possible. I mean, this time I've figured out a way to make it work for me. I'm, I'm very privileged to have some flexibility in that. But um, I think if you're able to send out maybe a doodle poll or something, that might be a little more helpful or ask for first preference and second preference, that would be also beneficial. Okay. Let me see what I get from Alicia and then um, Athena usually helps us with getting out polls. 
And I just want to point out um, when you get it, when we hit May and we're in the intense time with all the staff people coming in um, and it's meeting more often, if you get a sense that the people, I realize this is uh, people are giving their time as counselors who have full-time jobs, but if it's going to be, can only make some of them changing the schedule for all of them won't make sense. So just look forward, Andy, when you're, when you're asking this, because we hit that uh, twice a week um, period in May. Yeah. Thank I mean, you. After, Kathy, the, for... after that, we're, after that, we're back to the, whatever yeah. the morning. We go to Tuesdays and Thursdays, and typically we extend the meeting to three hour long meetings as well in order to get every department. Um, and we have two new departments this year. I can't remember if we, I think we had a next last year too, I guess. Um, but we'll have more robust presentations from two additional departments this year. So um, yeah, so we got to make sure we get everybody in. It was just a word of caution on, on asking for, for times that there's the may is may is unusual yeah and andy that just might be a future agenda item for the not too far future um thinking about committee assignments for the budget book and who's going to do what departments okay good reminder but i don't think there's anything else that we have on the agenda for 10 for this meeting so um unless somebody else has something that they want to raise really quickly. I don't see anybody who's uh, jumping to do so. Uh, we're adjourned and I thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Bye everybody. Bye everybody. Bye.